for all of his successes, Merv only had, you know, Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune were the only hits for him. The only other game show of his that lasted longer than a year, surprisingly, was Click. And that was only two years, you know. In terms of output, he was probably the least successful in terms of game show producers that we recognize. And that is Wesley Hyde, author of the brand new book, I'd Like to Buy a Vowel, Spinning 50 Years of Wheel of Fortune. And shortly we're going to find out who the host of Click was that was Merv Griffin's other kind of hit show besides Wheel and Jeopardy. Now, last time we were talking about Stu's show at stusshow.com, which Wesley is a contributor to once a month on Wednesdays at uh, 430 or the 4 o'clock Pacific time uh, once a month. So check that out. I don't know if you heard the story about, um, you know, saw it when Stu was there when um, Chuck uh, Willery had his show on Fox back in the late 1990s. I forget the name of the show. I want to say Greed. It's not Greed, is it? Yeah, I'm Greed was the I, show. Uh-huh. Okay, that was it. All right. So the, they had the category TV experts there. And the, the question was, which one of these shows did uh, Chuck Willery not host? Mm-hmm. And one of them was listed Wheel of Fortune, and the supposed TV expert said, "Oh yeah, he never did Wheel of Fortune." No, that you know, so that's what they locked on. And then Chuck had to tell them, "No, in fact, that was my first show that I did." He he was like, "Yeah," he was just like, "How could you forget that?" Was- <laughs> you know, but, but that's how it was. You know, even in the late '90s, you know, people had pretty much forgotten his connection with the show. <laughs> Um, that, you know, and that's with, and with him being on the show seven years, that's how time can affect things sometimes on, on TV. It's, it's amazing, you know. One time on but, Scrabble, um, the contestant said, I'll buy the E, and Chuck said, you don't have to pay it for it here. It wouldn't be funny if we had an electronic Vanna White placing the letters on the uh, screen right over here. <laughs> That'd be really cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, another thing, too, he can still do, I bet if you click out he can do do the spiel there you know about top dollar amount on the wheel is five hundred dollars in this round you know try not yeah. to get that black space that's bankrupt if you do lose your cash but not your merchandise because once you buy a prize it's yours to keep forever and ever and ever <laughs> that's exactly it you did it better than i could <laughs> let me look my finger now was saying, i just had knew i had to say that properly and then i was uh, in the clear when he was trying to replace fat say jack in the daytime version yeah <laughs> But but that's another thing, too, that just gets on my nerves, and I'm sure it's yours. The game shows nowadays, they don't have those quick introductions of the rules. You know, they, they did that. Peter Marshall, mm-hmm. you know, object of the game is to get uh, match the stars up and across, up and down, or diagonal, and da-da-da-da. We say the secret square, which is worth $2,000, and now tell them. You know, it's, it's just like that. It would just be rapid fire, and you'd get into the game. Nowadays, I mean, some of them, the ones on nighttime TV, it takes them, I've seen it, it takes them nearly a minute to give the rules. And I'm like, that you, that shouldn't be happening. Yeah. You, you're slowing down the game, you know? Well, it also might be so difficult to describe, and, and I forget who it was that said this. It was either Merv Griffin or, or Mark Goodson, that if you have to, if you have to spend more than 20 seconds describing a game, it probably is not a good game. Exactly. Exactly. But yeah. it, it, but even if you can't explain it, it might not be a good game or it may not succeed, even though it sounds you know good on paper. Like uh, when I yeah. talked to Wink Martindale a couple of years ago for the book I'm writing on Jack Berry, um, he said that, you know, Merv Griffin said, oh, my gosh, Headline Chasers, it's the next best thing. It's, it's going to be successful and all this stuff. But then Affiliate said – Man, this game is really, really hard. And as a as a thirteen year old watching it, I had a difficult time trying to figure out what the 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 headline was in those fake newspaper names like the Los Angeles News, the the New York Globe, the Boston mm-hmm. Times. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and like basically looking back on it, it was pretty much like Wheel of Fortune except with headlines. As far as the, yeah. the puzzle thing was concerned, did you ever see Merv's version of Monopoly? I did, and that was probably the worst game show host ever in Mike Riley. And yeah. I was just like, why didn't Pierre Tamarkin host this? Because I remember Pierre Tamarkin had hosted the pilot, and yeah. um, 
I even said to Peter when I met him, I was like, that guy was terrible. He says, yeah, that guy was a contestant on the pilot. And, uh, you know, just he, Peter was like, you know, the only reason he, you know, got the job because Merv Griffin liked that guy. And, and just like, yeah, I was like, whoa. Merv, if Merv liked you, then you got a job <laughs> as a host. I've noticed that about several times. Yeah. But yeah, he, was he was wooden and stiff, and he was a contestant yeah. on Jeopardy, but didn't even win. I'm thinking to myself, of all the people you could have selected, this was the guy. I mean, he was one of the worst hosts I'd ever seen. Patrick Wayne was better at Tic Tac Doe than Mike Riley was at, at Monopoly. Yeah, yeah. It was um, – I, I do touch on it there, you know. For all of his successes, Merv, Merv only had, you know, Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune were the only hits for him. Mm. Um, the only other uh, game show of his that lasted longer than a year, surprisingly, was Click with um, even the Ryan Seacrest, Seacrest yeah. back in the late 1990s. And that was only two years, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, Merv had a good gift with those two shows, you know, and you can prove it there, but in terms of output, he was probably the least successful um, in terms of game show producers that we recognize. You know, um, the others had, like you mentioned, Jack Berry had, you know, many g- successful game shows. Oh, yeah. But um, when it, you know, Merv just, it, he did try, they, there was even, um, there was a Saturday no- uh, morning version of Wheel of Fortune in 96, 97, around the late 90s called Wheel of Fortune or Wheel of Fortune 2000. Mm-hmm. And it tried to be educational along with that, and it was just a mess. And I had I had the hardest time getting anyone from that show to talk to me. I went through the producer and the star, and I finally got one of the um, per- persons on the production staff, and all I could do was email the questions and just got short answers. So mm. I'm like, I have a feeling no one really had a good time with that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I remember so. Wheel Two Thousand. It was kind of like you know, it looked like um, kind of like if if the uh, the designer of the Sev remote control had you know <laughs> suddenly painted the Wheel of Fortune set. That's what it yep. looked like. Yeah, exactly. And it was just uh, uh, it was um, it, it was just not the, as well done as normal Wheel. You know, I. I, I I still think a good kids version of that show could be made if someone tried it. I don't think they're going to make an effort anymore. I don't think they really um, do that much, you know, in terms of kids-oriented game shows, unfortunately. Yeah, they don't. Um, I mean, where's, when was the last time Wheel of Fortune had a teen week um, yeah. or even Jeopardy had a teen tournament? Um, yeah. As a little kid, I remember all these teen tournaments and, and kids shows on different programs, including Joker's Wild. Yeah. But by the time I became old enough for Joker, 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 it got canceled. And they only yeah. had kids weeks on the Joker's Wild after that. So I was like, oh, yeah. man, I was born too late. Yeah. They had the teen weeks on Wheel of Fortune all the way going back to the 70s. Oh, that's right. They had a – yeah, and they had some other themed weeks. They had like Armed Forces Week. That was good. They finally, I think enough viewers complained that they finally added the Coast Guard on there one time, or was it the mirror? <laughs> I can't remember. It was one branch, and they're like, oh, why don't you have? And they're like, well, we can't because it's not officially. And I think people are like, this is bogus. So <laughs> they eventually gave it in there. And um, yeah, I did talk to Andrea Hall, who was Deidre Hall's sister. Oh, yeah. And. Um, they did a guest shot on the show for when they had one of the Brides Week, and she said that she and Indeed were laughing their heads off because, you know, they were, like, around these fake flowers and, you know, dressed up in bridal dresses. <laughs> like, this is too weird. <laughs> <laughs> but we've got to do it anyway. And they uh, and they were doing it because that was a time when um, – Deidre's character was getting married on Days of Our Lives that week, so it was kind of a tie-in, you know, mm. to promote it and do that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I miss that stuff. And also, some people don't realize it, but they don't go on location anymore because the expense is too much. You know, oh. remember they go, like, to Hawaii or, mm-hmm. you know, to Dallas or... Um, Radio City New Music York Hall. City. Yeah, Radio City Music Hall, Yeah. I remember Don Pardo announced those episodes when they came yeah. from uh, Radio City Music Hall. Yeah, but it was just getting too expensive. It was cost them $3 million each time they do that. And then 
that would also they need the help of kind of the local stations, you know, to make sure they got everything together for the production. And um, and then Harry Friedman just said, it, this is too much cost, too much hassle, you know, so we're just going to stop it. And I think the current producer seems to be the same way. Oh, yeah. So. I remember um, before Harry Friedman was Nancy Jones. Uh, did yeah. you get a chance to talk to her as well? She passed away in 2018. Oh. And but you, if you didn't know it, you're not surprised because I looked. There was no coverage of her passing in Variety or Hollywood Reporter or the L.A. Times. It was um, it was one of the members of the alumni group, in fact, who found out about it because she passed away in Hawaii, and I think it was like the. Honolulu newspaper or something that carried the information about her death. And, uh, yeah, after she was basically, she was fired from the show because Sony wanted someone more in line of what they wanted with their vision. And I think they also thought that she was kind of tied to Merv too much, you know, and they wanted to have their own stamp on it. So they got rid of her in 1995 and she went on to do Pictionary and, uh, as a producer there, and she got her, I think it was her 13th and last Emmy nomination. She never won, unfortunately, when she did that. But then when Pictionary went off, she just decided, all right, I have enough of this. I'm just going to retire to uh, Hawaii. And that's where she lived for the last uh, two decades of her life, you know? Wow. So, yeah. So uh, I think she did pretty well. Um, she had gone there. She'd been part of um, Chuck Barris's production company back in the 60s before freelancing. And then when she worked on the 1974 pilot for Wheel of Fortune, she did well enough that they made her uh, assistant producer. And then the producer of the show, when they did the hour-long shows, and Merv being Merv, decided he wasn't going to pay the staff any extra money, even though they were working longer on it. That producer said, okay, I'm out of here. And then so Merv bumped Nancy up to executive producer. And she had that for nearly 19 years. Wow. Yeah. 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 A good run there. And, you know, she was, if not the first, one of the first female executive producers of a game show ever. And um, she really set the look and tone of the show for it to have, you know, the prizes that it had at the time and the uh, glamour and pacing, you know, so she deserves a lot of credit. But as I note in the book, <laughs> incredibly wheel of fortune so far has only won once as it won outstanding game show. And that honor was shared with that's right. Jeopardy. Hmm. It tied with Jeopardy when it won the thing, which wow. I'm like, how, how, was the voting that much on the nose, really? Uh, and I note in the book, it's a recurring thing, how people compare it against unfavorably against Jeopardy, which, ironically, you know, Merv Griffin created that, too. And it was, Jeopardy was the reason why Wheel of Fortune got on the air. It got in, under production because Lynn Bolin hated the original version of Jeopardy, um, which originally had, like, ridiculously small amount of the prize, even for the 1960s and 70s, you know, it, it oh, yeah. would be it, the first category would be the values were 10, 20, 30, 40, and $50, you know, and mm -hmm. if a show ended and a contestant had won over a thousand dollars, that was meant the contestant was really smart, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's how bad it was. And, and it was in New York where it was crowded, you know, it was a small studio, she didn't like uh, Art Fleming. She thought was middle aged and and looked and sounded it. She and she the contestants. It was a stationary show, as she put it. You know, people behind desks. She didn't like it, and she told Merv to come up with an alternative thing. And he came up with a lot of the basic elements for Wheel of Fortune. Although she was the one who told them she wanted the shopping thing. So he mm. was like, "Okay, well, we'll work that in there." <laughs> and it took them, yeah, they, they did a pilot in 1973 originally with Chuck Woolery that didn't sell because it was very complicated. Then they refined the rules into what we know as Wheel of Fortune today in 74. And that one sold, but, you know, with uh, the problems that they had with Ed Burns and his drinking, they mm -hmm. decided to go back to Chuck Woolery. And Chuck had 
been getting more opportunities. And so he's kind of leery about doing a game show, but then they brought him around and said, you know, come on, give it a shot. And he did. And it's what made him famous. And we are in conversation with Wesley Hyatt, author of 10, actually 11 books. His 11th just came out. It's called I'd Like to Buy a Vowel, Spinning 50 Years of Wheel of Fortune, which you can get online either at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your local mom-and-pop bookstore. Also, you can get it at bearmanormedia.com. That's the publisher, B-E-A-R-M-A-N-O-R, bearmanormedia.com. And next time we share more stories about Lynn Bolin, who was head of daytime programming at NBC in the early to mid-70s, as well as somebody who was president of not just CBS and ABC, but NBC as well, and how he hated game shows. Plus how he tried to beat Wheel, but the Wheel beat him. <laughs> 